right, so good morning. Welcome to Tech Lam Live. I'm Joe Mejica. Hey everyone, I'm Doreen Peppers. And joining us today is our special guest, Chris Phillips from the Customer Experiencing Team. Uh, how are you doing today, Chris? Pretty good, how about you folks? Doing well, doing well. So today we're gonna to be learning more about TAC as an organization. And as Cisco customers, we are very familiar with TAC as a break fix service when things go wrong. But TAC is so much more than a break fix team. It's a global customer experience center. And today we're gonna to be giving away a WebEx camera. So that's gonna be an awesome prize that we have planned to give out. And you need to stick around to the end of the show and play a Slido with us. And then uh, we're gonna go ahead and pick a winner and give out the WebEx Desk Pro camera. And speaking of WebEx, today's episode is brought to you by WebEx One. So WebEx One is a free virtual event uh, designed to showcase all things new and upcoming with WebEx and hybrid work. If you haven't had a chance to register, you can scan the QR code or go to webex.com forward slash WebEx One. The event will be held on October 26 and 27. We hope to see everyone there, um, especially if you get a uh, WebEx camera from today's event. So looking forward to having a great time. Awesome. So Chris, you've been involved in so many great adventures during your career journey. Can you tell us more about your experience? Sure thing. Um, I started at Cisco back in 2000. Um, I was a targeted industry hire. My background was in telco switching equipment. Um, so any of you voice fo folks out there, I was doing the service provider voice side. My specific expertise was SS7 protocol. So uh, very niche market, very few people knew it, and Cisco was looking to get into that technology, so they hired folks with my experience. I started off in uh, professional services. It was called uh, network services back then. It was a long time ago. Mainly all focused on service provider voice solutions. So if you ever got like a triple play combo from like Comcast, Time Warner, or any of those other customers, um, I supported everything from the, the cable modem all the way until it made out to the regular telephone network. Uh, after that, I moved over into technical services to actually start supporting some of the equipment over there. My first stint was with the WAN technologies, uh, focusing on everything like frame relay, you name it, all of those stuff. Uh, moved over to multi-service in the early days of voice. Uh, so all the early router-based voice worked on that, worked on all those products. Saw things like evolve from like Call Manager Express, IP, IP Gateway into what we have as the product suite now. I also supported... Avid Technologies, um, so that was the early call manager solution. Uh, I also did solution support and then telepresence. The last things I started doing as uh, telepresence was team lead, tech lead. I was actually still taking cases at that time. Um, and the big, big thing during that time was helping bring that technology into run the business after we acquired Tamburg. Uh, later on, I switched over into management. I started in the telepresence space, managing there. Uh, from there, I moved over to Widget Apps, as we call it, or you folks would know it as Jabber I'm in Presence, and I manage over now in the uh, call manager space. I actually still do both technologies. Uh, I am a retired 30-year Marine veteran, and I help create our Veterans Talent Incubation Program. We call it VTIP, and I really enjoy helping university relations with hiring and mentoring new engineers coming into our industry, and I also do the same for transitioning veterans still. Okay. Wow, that, that's quite an impressive resume. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. Uh, but Chris, can you tell us a little bit more about your role within TAC and anything you want to share around that space? Yeah, sure thing. And it's obvious, yeah, I'm a manager in, the, in technical services, and that's where I've been the majority of my career. And I am responsible for the basic delivery um, of my teams, and that's uh, focusing on everything from, you know, basic case taking to filing defects, handling escalations. Uh, it goes far beyond that. It's uh, everything from product serviceability, product improvements, helping bridge uh, customer use stories um, with our business units, help making those arguments, everything to, uh, you name it, under the sun. It's like a one-stop shop per se. I like to tell customers that like, when they interact with our organization, realistically, it's their beginning of their engineering experience with Cisco. Um, I was a previously a technology owner, so I was responsible for addressing product serviceability, like I said before, large-scale product issues or solutions, uh, coming up with uh, anything from support issue resolution, you name it, everything to basically increase ease of doing business with our, uh, with our products 
and with our, uh, our organization. I also help manage the relationship between the business unit and our organization. Um, in my space, we have you know, probably four or 500 people uh, with regards to service delivery and call manager specific. Um, so there's a lot of things that has to happen between their leadership, our leadership, and then the delivery team. I just try to fix all that I can and make sure everything is running smoothly for our customers, and, you know, specifically in this product space and then anything else that I'm uh, that I have to be responsible for. I'm also very involved with um, intellectual cop capital creation. That's everything from knowledge capture, uh, things like automation. How do we, uh, you know, basically spread the knowledge across a wide, uh, a wide group of engineers and across a product space. And then, of course, you know, just the overall delivery of that. Got it. Okay. Did you want to um, go ahead and share your presentation? Sure. All right. So basically, we're going to we're going to talk about what, you know, TAC does, what our ideas are, how do we deliver things? Um, it's a it's a it's a broad scope, just like any of you folks in the IT industry, when you sit down and you do your job on a daily basis, you know, somebody's going to have to make the coffee in the morning you know, for your team, along with supporting the products, taking cases, you know, all of that managing. And, you know, it's really a big question of how do we do it and what are our, our overall goals? So we start with um, like CX setters. When you take a look at our organization, we're a global order or organization. And, you know, when we take a look at overall how we want to support our customers, uh, you know, one thing that should have popped up on the screen, which it doesn't for some odd reason right now, um, is that if we want our customers, if we know about a, a, a defect um, or a problem or any of that stuff, we want to know how to resolve it first before our customers run into it. And it's a big question of how do we actually do this? Uh, so that's what we're going to dig into. Um, how do we do this? So we take 30 years of our knowledge, um, and that's everything from the industry best people. Uh, I, I'm one. I, I would some people would consider me one of them, but I do have people that work with me that are much smarter than I, and we leverage their knowledge. And when I say that, when you take a look at our organization, we have everybody from folks with a very low level of, of of education to folks that have PhDs in our organization. I even hired a guy that's a medical doctor. I mean, who doesn't want to say that they have a, a doctor on their team? Uh, but if you look at our organization, the majority of people have some form of a professional education. Uh, I myself am an electrical engineer. I went to North Carolina State University. And the majority of folks have electrical engineering degrees, computer science degrees, um, computer engineering degrees, and stuff like that. Uh, but we also have folks that have no formal education at all. And one of uh, a good friends of mine from the Marine Corps got hired at Cisco, uh, never completed college. He just went through and decided that wasn't for him. He actually has filed a couple patents. Um, he's not written a book yet, but I suppose that's on his, um, his, uh, his future. Um, he actually is a lead software architect for uh, not Cisco anymore, but one of our competitors. And he was one of our regular tech engineers uh, and his superpower was he has photographic memory. He could literally read anything and then just know it instantaneously. So we have lots of folks like that. And in the end, before he left Cisco, he was uh, working escalations with Chuck Robbins and John Chambers directly. Uh, so it's, it's not about you know, what somebody has on their, on their resume, it's about what the context of the character is. So those are the industry best people that we have. We also leverage the customer insights, things that you know, customer use stories uh, could be even down to, you know, just uh, a case that somebody opens. And we leverage that knowledge and we spread it throughout our organization. So, you know, what is our organization? You know, it's a, I'm sure you folks know all of this, this stuff, the 365, 24 by 7 organization. Um, we're in 180 different countries. Uh, we, you know, have language uh, capabilities in 17 different languages, and we have labs all over the place, 170 labs. We have five major labs, which are, are massive uh, places. If you come to Research Triangle Park, where I am based out of, our lab there takes up the full floor. And I think, you know, last I saw it, it was, uh, you know, a little over a billion dollars worth of Cisco equipment in there used for everything from customer recreates and all of that stuff. So 
it's uh, resources at hand. As a as a company, we're um, in 75% of the top you know Fortune 100 companies. They rely on us for their delivery of of their products, um, whatever it is. It could be financial products, it could be manufacturing products, you name it. Whatever it is, they rely on Cisco technology to make that happen. And then you know you take a look at you know the organization, the people. What is it? Uh, overall, we've got about 12,000 people specifically dedicated in customer experience to our delivery. And that's everything from professional services, all the ancillary support that goes along there, and then technical services. Technical services alone has roughly 6,000 people within it. So then we take a look at you know the global team and what does it look like. Uh, when I first came to Cisco, it only we only had really four sites. That was Research Triangle Park, Raleigh, North Carolina. San Jose, uh, Sydney, Australia, and Brussels, Belgium. Uh, it's obviously expanded far beyond that. Um, now our major regional centers in the United States are Research Triangle Park, Richardson, Texas, uh, Mexico City, uh, San Jose, and then all of the other places that we stood up around the globe. And those are all there for you know providing a consistent delivery around the clock. And as a customer, I would always suggest you to take a look at um, our support as, you know, taking the planet and divide it into quarters. Um, every six hours, we essentially have a change of, I, I want to say ownership, but basically who is responsible for providing the global coverage for our teams. So for North America, we cover roughly 12 hours, and that goes from 0, 08 in the morning till about 20 hundred uh, East Coast time. After that, we hand off to the Asia Pacific TAC, and then it goes over, you know, into the uh, EMEAR region. Um, and then at a certain point, it'll wrap back into the United States. So, you know, depending on when you open a case is essentially when you're where you're going to end up with that case being supported. Um, along with our regional centers, we also have our global delivery partners uh, that are staged in various places, Costa Rica, uh, Amman, Jordan, uh, Bangalore, India, you know, or sorry, that's uh, New Delhi, in India. And so we have coverage everywhere you can imagine. We have tons of teams and tons of capacity. Uh, some of the reasons we have that, obviously, is to uh, bifurcate our traffic and send it to the various regional centers, but it also provides us business continuity that if there is ever a, an impact, like in North Carolina, we experience sometimes ice storms, uh, uh, hurricanes, things like that where maybe our engineers won't be able to make it into the office if um, that's what we're doing. Uh, they would be able to offload some of that volume to another center and provide seamless uh, support to the customer. And again, you know, this is all the stuff that we saw before. Uh, probably some of the big things to note are the average tenure of our engineers. When you take a look at it, you know, everybody has about six years of experience and one of the things I heard years ago was like uh, it, it was uh, applying to professional athletes, but uh, you, they say it takes roughly uh, five to six thousand hours uh, to be to start to become an expert. And if you take a look at the tenure of uh, engineers, it's us that's usually in the range of two and a half to three years for somebody to become an expert. So that means by the time you get an average of six years, you have a lot of SMEs on your teams. And that's what our customers are always looking for, is they're looking for that SME type of support to, to help our customers. So one of the big things that we've been pushing for, um, and I don't even want to say pushing for, we've been striving for is proactive issue resolution. Uh, and that's an interesting discussion. And it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things, how do we do it? And there's a lot of things that go into it. First, uh, you know, it would be great if we knew a problem existed in a customer's network and we could jump in and take care of it or guide a customer to, uh, to addressing it before it impacts any business. Uh, it tends to be the, over the years, the industry has been more reactive, but we are trying to push towards a proactive stance. And there's a lot of things that have to happen to make that, to make it work. The first thing is we have to start with digitalized intellectual capital. And uh, again, I'll, I'll step back. What is intellectual capital? It's everything that's within our heads and digitizing it is putting it in a form that you can share it with everybody. It could be anything from a knowledge base article. I'm sure a lot of you folks do that within your own organization um, to filing defects. We do that. Um, and then how do we apply that to the whole organization? The other part is connected CX or 
you know, connected TAC. Uh, there's been various terms, but how do we get access to the information within a customer's network uh, and then apply our intellectual capital to it? And that's, if somebody, well, you want to say that's where the magic happens, but that's where the rubber meets the road. So what is digital digitized intellectual capital? For us right now, we have it defined as four very distinct things. Uh, customer found defects. Um, those are the things that, uh, you know, essentially escape out into the wild. Uh, customer might run into them. Could be various scenarios. It could be uh, something going on within the software itself. And, you know, in general, you'll open a case. You will triage it. We'll file the defect. It'll get posted. You guys can look at it. And uh, the, the, the magic is applying that to everybody. And if I look back at a conversation that was had in our organization back in, I want to say 2003 or 2004, uh, some of our customers had reached out to us through a survey. And, you know, we, you know, they were like, hey, Cisco, you're a great company. You have great products and all that. But if you could do two things better, uh, you would make us love you that much more. And they're kind of obvious. Um, one was like, if you could resolve our, our case quicker. Um, so we always tried to do that. Um, and then the other one was, how do I get to the right resource the first time? Um, and that's that's a big challenge for, for any organization. And so a lot of the things that we've done are around that. Uh, case in point for years, you know, it, was, it would always, you know, humor you to watch somebody pick up a case. Um, they have a new problem to them that they've never seen before, and they're working on it after a while. And they lean across the aisle and they ask somebody, they're like, hey, Doreen, you know, I'm having a problem with this case, you know, uh, can you give me a little help? And she would look at it and be like, oh, I ran into this last week. It's this problem. Well, how do you do that at scale across a whole organization? That's, that's a huge challenge. Uh, you can only send out so many emails and all of that stuff to get it done. So that's where some of the digitization comes in and how do we apply it to everybody. So customer found defects was certainly the first one. And what we do is we essentially create a signature um, if we can to identify that defect. And it could be something that would show up in a log file or some various situation that we could digitize and look for certain things and use automation to do that. Uh, and in the end, it's not about, you know, replacing any talent. It's about getting from point A to point B very quickly. You know, if you take a look at the evolution of working on things, uh, I remember years ago I was uh, over with a mechanic having them replace front wheel bearings on my car. The guy whips out a special tool that they got from uh, a tool vendor, and they were able to replace th these bearings in like, I don't know, 45 minutes for each side. If you went by the book, it took about four to five hours for the book to do it, where you'd have to pull the vehicle apart. You had to take it and stick it on a press. But instead, they could do it right there on the car. And so a lot of these tools are about that, where you take a, some automation uh, and you might have a show tech from like a UCS platform. Those are a couple gig. And, you know, if you were to print out each page of that, you know, maybe it would stack as high as the uh, Empire State Building. But this automation can go and be like narrow it down to these pages on, you know, somewhere around the 43rd floor of the building. You know, let's start looking there quickly. Um, and it does that within a few minutes compared to where it might take a person many hours to do that. So there's an immediate benefit there. We also do the same thing with field notices and P-certs, which are security alerts that would go out to the customer. And those are the things that would pop up when we a customer would upload logs or things like that to the case that we could automatically get that information and then we could disseminate it to the customer as needed and all of that other stuff. For RMAs, uh, what we look at is many levels of automation with regards to anything from defects and field notice as they apply to hardware, but also to we use uh, what we call uh, internally it's IRE, but it's um, AI artificial intelligence that takes a look at everything from serial numbers, uh, hardware revisions, uh, what's being described as the problem with the, uh, the product or, you know, what the case was opened over. And it makes some very quick decisions. It'll look back historically and say, well, with these characterizations, this is always an RMA. Let's go step right into the RMA processing instead of going a bunch of ping ponging of emails back and forth. So again, it's a getting from point A to point B quicker 
because that's what our customers are looking for. They're not looking, they're, they're like, I know this is a problem and they want to get the part replaced. And so that expedites the process. So what is connected experience? That's the, uh, the little, the little unknown here that, you know, maybe you, you, I can help illuminate. So, you know, we'll start off with a customer's network, um, something you guys touch and work with every day. Uh, I know that you have it, but I don't know what's in it. Um, and, and the same thing could be said for anybody who works external of your company. Uh, we, what we have is we have our knowledge and we have our tools. And, you know, you take a look at what the, you know, the standard experience that customers have is, is they would open a case. Um, we would ask them for information that gets attached to the case. And it could be that a human, you know, like back in the early days when I did it, you know, send me the log file, send me your show run, chauffeur, all that stuff. And I would start looking through it and see what I find, you know, that is characterized your, around your problem. Uh, but now if you do provide us that stuff, you know, you reach out to us for a problem in your network. We ask you for a set of logs when they get attached to the case. Our uh, intellectual capital will start processing on it immediately and applying our knowledge, the tools that we've created internally. And, you know, it'll basically spit out the information, the digitized information to, you know, the engineer and at times directly to the customer. And in the end, once that, that whole loop is uh, closed, we, we provide the resolution back to the customer and basically repair your network. That's what the intention is. So how to experience the value of our knowledge. Uh, there's a couple things that are out there right now. Um, one is command line analyzer. It's free. You guys can go out there, just Google it. Um, you can find it on YouTube, whatever. Uh, it's, it's freely available out there. And it's a, it's a very interesting uh, product. Basically what it is, is an SSH or Telnet client, whatever that you can get into. You know, one of your more traditional, uh, like maybe iOS driven products you know, where you have a command line experience. And really what it, uh, I like to describe it as it provides essentially like a tech engineer looking over your shoulder. So you can do some commands and, you know, maybe you do a chauffeur and it points out something like, you know, about your, hey, this, this uh, software version has a P-cert on it or something like that. Or you do a, a show run and it puts, uh, figure, it points out some issues that, hey, you know, we see that you have this configured, but Cisco best practices are to do this. Um, and it's not, it's up to you whether you want to do these things or not. Or maybe you're troubleshooting something and you're looking at interface commands or something like that. It will highlight and point out issues with um, interfaces and it'll give you links to documentation, knowledge base articles and all that and direction of what to do. Um, and it's freely available. The big caveat is you, you need to be connected to the cloud because um, it's continuously updated, and that's where the intellectual capital comes from. So, uh, but it's it's right there, and it's not about you know deflecting work. It's about actually you know helping a customer resolve their pay, their problems quicker. Uh, a lot of folks like to work on and solve their own problems, and you know at a certain point, if they can't do it on their own, then they have to reach out for another resource. Could be Cisco TAC, it could be another person within their organization. Uh, but this provides that knowledge that you would normally get through a case directly there right in front of you. Um, it allows you to do all of that stuff right off, right off the bat. So, you know, strongly advise people take a look at that if you haven't done that. Um, you know, CX Connected. We have uh, what we call Diagnostic Bridge. And this is all of these things have in general been move, merged, moved over into or merged over into our customer experience portals. Uh, but, you know, if you have devices that are registered and you're using our uh, connectivity back to our our cloud, we can run certain forms of automation, everything from titration type information, uh, unsolicited uh, log information that gets popped out, any of those things. And it will be flagged on the diagnostic bridge where you can drill down and you could take a look at those issues. Um, you could choose to ignore them. You could choose to address them. You could choose to get a case opened with them. And, uh, you know, again, it's a, a massive benefit to the customer, all provided through a cloud experience. And then finally, there's the the uh, CX advisor for those folks that have picked that up where, you know, it provides uh, an experience where somebody will engage somebody within our organization that takes a look at a, at a larger scale uh, of a customer's environment. Uh, everything from 
pulling the software versions, looking at various configurations, features and use and all that, and being able to provide a proactive guided experience for either performance enablement where you know maybe you're doing a certain type of work with our product, but you're not enabling a feature that enhances the, pro the performance of what you're trying to do. And we can help guide through the processes, get the right resources engaged, and uh, help you know expedite moving over in that direction and improve the experience. So in the end, when we go back to it, what is it all when you when you plug it all together, what do we get? Um, and we refer to that overall thing as the connected experience. And basically, <clears throat> our goal are some of the common sense items that you you folks will see. And this is not really marketing type things. This is really what we we want to do. We want to increase our, our products availability within a customer's environment because that's the experience you have. You want to buy, you know, it's like buying a car. You don't want to have to like every day I go out to use my car, I got to put oil in it or I got to keep inflating the tires or do do something that you would consider uh, abnormal. Same thing with our products. So it'll increase the availability. It'll help increase the security, um, increase the overall performance. Uh, you know, the, the delivery, it could be anything, like I said, from right sizing or enabling features. And in the end, the, the, you know, to leadership, they're going to look for reducing OPEX, the operational expenditure, expenditures you folks have, so you don't have to buy things you don't need um, or services you don't need. And for us, we always try to <clears throat> say that it's driving a, a, the delivery of an effortless and proactive experience, because in the end, you just want things to work. And that's, you know, you, you want to focus on, you know, the the overall business uh, targeted goal instead of, you know, having to always mess with the network and and, and opening cases and, and troubleshooting. So, you know, what is the, what is the, the the next step look like? Well, it's it's all about providing a closed loop experience for our customers. Um, for us, you know, the customer is the center and we have two different ways for providing this closed loop experience to our customers. First, within our organization, within CX, and it could also be within the business units when we run into issues, uh, we help identify them, we uh, further define them, we define a root cause, and then we fix it. And in the end, that fix gets applied to our customers. And the same thing happens, you know, maybe a problem arises at, you know, you, and it gets applied to another customer, but it usually, you know, you share the wealth of somebody else run, runs into a problem first. You know, we identify the issue, we define the root cause, and uh, we fix it, and it gets applied to our full customer base. And that's uh, it's it's the way it, you know it works, and everybody is is fine with that. Um, but the main thing to re to remember is, with a large customer base, we are able to take knowledge from everywhere, and through our digitization. Um, you know, peanut butter is probably the word you would use, but to be able to provide that kind of knowledge and, you know, everything from resolutions, uh, serviceability, all of that across our full product portfolio into our full customer base, that's what the, uh, that's what our target is. And that's, that's what all of our efforts have led up to right now. <clears throat> so how does this all come together? So we, we, we take a look at a case, you know, a customer in this instance might have a full service interruption. You know, they open a case, they call, they could call in, whatever. Um, and we'll, we'll take a step back and take a look at what is a service interruption also. Um, but somebody calls in and they initiate a, a, like a SEV1 call. So uh, what are the severity severities? You know, we could take a look at that really quickly. Uh, we call it just, you know, the prioritization or, of the case. And we'll take a look at like SEV ones and SEV twos. Realistically, within our organization, we treat them pretty much the same. Uh, we, you, you have all hands on deck for Cisco side, and you know if it's severity one, you know it's pretty much going to be production down. You're hard down, or you've lost a critical component of your business. And Cisco will be with you 24 hours a day um, until we get you restored, uh, or until you've decided that yeah. You know, it's time to step back and do something different, um, but we'll still stay engaged. Severity two, uh, severely degraded, significant business impact. Again, you know, if you're looking at definitions, these are really close to each other. Um, again, we are going to continue still working on these things 24 hours. Uh, I know it doesn't say there, but 
that's what we do. Um, and as long as the customer is engaged, you know, we're 100% on it. And if it is pointing at Cisco, if it's determined to be like a defect or something else, um, we're going to stay engaged. And I definitely encourage customers uh, to make sure that you keep the case severity at the, at the appropriate severity level. So if somebody, uh, if it is pointing to Cisco and you're pending us um, and it's like a severity one or two, yeah, just tell them like, yeah, it needs to remain that until we get to the point where our business is restored or we're satisfied with the uh, the solution. Sep threes and sep fours ten, tends to be the run of the business stuff. Realistically, the majority of our cases are opened as sep threes, but they probably should be a sep four. Um, a lot of them are open are asking for general assistance, uh, could be config assist, product feature function questions, things like that. Um, a lot of those, you know would be a SEV4, but, you know, in the end, we, we treat the SEV3s and SEV4s pretty much the same. Uh, you know, we will see cases come in certainly as a SEV3, and me, like when I was an engineer looking at it, I'm like, eh, this actually should probably be a higher severity, and I would, you know, bump the severity for the case. A good example would be uh, maybe a customer wants to turn up a service on Friday, and they open a case on Monday. We're kind of running close to you know, getting everything resolved and up and running and tested and, you know, a total thumbs up on it. So situations like that, we don't want to wait till Thursday when suddenly, you know, everything's on fire, you know, and we have to have this live for tomorrow for, you know, our CEO of our company, you know, get that kind of information in front of us first, you know, let us know what's going on. Could be, you know, business timelines for yourself, projects that you're working on. It could be that while this is something small, it affects something very large, you know. Uh, all of those things are very important for us to, deter to determine the uh, prioritization of the case because that helps the, us determine how we are going to uh, basically base our cadence and then help drive the case with the customers. So somebody calls in and they, they provide basically the, you know, the problem that they're having. They're they, usually the first person they're going to interact uh, interact with is what we call the Cisco Interactive Network, um, or SIN. And these are gonna be our frontline folks. That's another term that you'll hear. Um, in general, they're not gonna be very skilled. Um, they're gonna be there for gathering the information, uh, verifying it with you and getting a case open, and then working through uh, the handoff. And part of the warm handoff, what happens behind the scenes is our intelligent matching. Um, if you go back to like what I said a while back, which was, our customers uh, asked us, you know, one, to resolve our cases quicker, and then two, how do I get to the right resource the first time? Well, back in, at that time in 2003, there really wasn't the technology or the tools to make that happen. Um, we tried various um, iterations of special routing queues and all of this other stuff um, with various levels of success, but it didn't, um, it, it didn't bring us to where we're at now with the ability to do the matching the way we do. And the way we do it now is we first and foremost, you look at uh, resource availability. That's all there is to it. Is somebody working that day? Are they logged in? And are they available to take work? That's, that's the, you know, that's the no brainer part of it. After that, we use uh, basically a formula of guesstimating who would be the, the right resource to work on an issue. And we do that through skilling. Um, and a lot of times you folks open cases, you'll see that there's specific sub technologies that you're opening on um, and problem codes. And we use those as part of our skilling uh, mechanism. And we'll rate people from zero to five, uh, five being a, an expert, zero having no expertise in it at all. If somebody has a zero, then we're not even gonna present them the work. They won't see that it's there and they won't be targeted if they're, you know, anything within that range, then we use some determining factors to see who is gonna be the person that you know we should choose. And again, we, we'll start with uh, availability. We take a look at, it. is somebody logged in and available? Um, how much work have they taken that day, that week, that month? And then what is their backlog of work? And that's part of the calculation along with their skilling. And we choose the most appropriately skilled person first. We're not gonna go with the highest skilled because that wouldn't make the model work if you're always choosing the highest skilled you know, person because it would all, all the work would converge on those people. So we use those combinations to identify a resource and get them in front of, uh, get the case in front of an engineer. 
So then, you know, the warm handoff takes place. You know, the uh, the SIN agent, you know, reaches out, an engineer accepts the case, and you know, first thing they ask, you're like, hey, are you free to take a call? And the the engineer says yes. And usually at that time, our our engineers will like immediately send out like a WebEx invite uh, to get on a bridge with a customer. It might be that they already have a bridge, but there'll be a little warm handoff there, a handshake. And you should look at it as like a three-way handshake. You know, first person you know comes on, hey, they introduce whoever is on there. They have a problem with this technology. You know, are you you know are you the right resource and ready to help them? And the engineer says, yes, I, I work on this technology. I understand what this problem is. And there's a little then agreement with the customer. And they're like, yes, this, this person does understand, you know, what I need support on. And at that point, the handoff happens. This handshake can happen multiple times. Everything from case movement, engaging folks across uh, adjacent technologies. You know, maybe you're looking at a problem that involves multiple technologies, or some people like to always refer to it as a solution. Um, but you know, I don't know necessarily would call you know using our voice technology on our switching platform a solution. Some people might want to say that, but you know, you know maybe we're working a, a call problem and we see there's drop packets in a customer's network, so we need to involve somebody maybe from uh, the WAN technologies. Uh, you know, people who do that routing and switching whatever and we get on there and we all talk about the problem customer agrees yes we you know you understand what's going on and it's everything down to even uh, the the what has been done and what the next actions are so now the engineer and the customer are connected um you know and the engineer documents you know basically what's going on providing it in external notes that's very important um you know and if we need to do like a follow the sun process where you know it, maybe it's a high severity case Problem's not resolved, but it's past the working hours of an engineer, um, the regular office hours. We do have the ability, because we're a 24-7 operation, that we can hand the uh, the case and the customer to somebody else. And we do it through a, a collaboration process. And again, we go through the three-way handshake. What we know, what, what has been done, and then what the expected next things to be done are. And each time that process happens, the customer should be comfortable with it. And uh, once the handoff is done, then the new engineer, you know, accepts ownership of the case and they continue on. Um, so there's a lot of things that are very useful for the actual best practices for making the support go as smoothly as possible. And so these should be uh, things it don't it you don't necessarily have to do them all, but it should be top of mind that this helps smooth the process. Part part of it is um, having op active contracts. We are looking at ways of support first. Uh, look at uh, you know you know, making sure that somebody has coverage later. Uh, that's uh, you know that's just about the ease of doing business portion. Um, you, you know if you have things like serial numbers um, or anything about you know that that device that it might be specific. That we have an RMA. Well, you're probably going to need the serial number for that. Um, you know if you can provide a an active accurate problem description and uh, problem details and probably even more importantly you know if you step a couple uh, lines down provide steps to reproduce that's like gold for a lot of people that's really really important um, next after that you know being able to explain your network um, having a topology if you have it i mean we could always try to whiteboard it but uh yeah have that stuff available so somebody could be like well yeah i see that you know I don't know how many times we, you know, we've we've uh, said like, hey, it looks like that there's, you know, we could see there's this is happening in network. There must be a firewall on the path, and somebody would be like, no, there's no firewall. And after you dig in a while, there was a firewall. So you know, having that information to be able to help fault isolate um, a lot quicker is is really really important. Also, having things like software revisions, um, hardware models, all of that stuff is um, very important to the overall process. Uh, there's other things that you can do, like subscribing to our support notification service. Some of the things that I identified earlier for specific products, like if you're subscribed to, you know, like ASA firewalls or something like that, um, you know, you could get uh, emails that'll tell you about a re recently released field notices or P certs and things like that. Um, you could also subscribe to uh, Bug Toolkit. 
where you could monitor defects and all that, you know, like maybe you open a case, somebody identifies a defect, maybe it was something that you ran into first or somebody else ran into it and it's not fixed yet. You can monitor that defect using the, the notification service and it'll tell you when the chat status changed, like maybe resolved or verified or something like that. And then it would be up to you to download the software and install it. Um, part of, you know, the closed loop on that, you know, is like, so we get back to the point where, you know, the engineer, you know, has maybe identified something and we we look at, you know, the, the process of moving towards resolution. So maybe it is a defect and, you know, maybe the defects get resolved. You know, it, we don't want to basically run and dump on the case. The expectation is that, you know, the customer should be like, yes, we're going to install the software and then they test and verify and say, yeah, it resolved the problem and we close the case. And that should be an, an agreement. Now, I know I'm a little step ahead here, but, uh, you know, that's one of the things to think about as we apply our digitized intellectual capital to these cases and all of that, that it is kind of a, uh, a, a little bit of a negotiation and agreement between the customer about what's resolution and when we should close the case. So, you know, in this instance, you know, we're going to look at somebody does say, hey, we need some logs, you know, maybe get a show tech or something like that. They upload it to the case. And what instantly happens as soon as those logs are all the way up to the case is our intellectual capital starts executing it uh, against it. You know, they put the average of eight minutes out there. You got to think, you know, first, how long it might take from, uh, you know, log to get from point A to point B and all that. But once it gets up there, um, you know, depending on the hours of the day, you know, you're going to be competing with the global team. But it averages around eight minutes um, for very lar large log files. Um, in my business space, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, two gig attachments, um, you know, process in three to four minutes, which in realism, that seems like an eternity while you're sitting there. It's like watching, you know, watching water boil or something like that, you know, as you're sitting like, oh, my, you know, waiting for the results. But realistically, in the big scheme of things, that's pretty quick compared to somebody actually having to open the log, download the log files, open them and start parsing through them to get to the point of uh, being able to try to fault isolate. So, uh, you know, just keep in mind, you know, as soon as you get a chance, upload those logs. Um, and so what happens if things aren't moving along at, as you would expect? Well, we do have the ideas of escalations and there's two places you can take a look at it. There's first the TAC resource guide. And this is something that you could download and print out. And it covers a lot of the information that I talked about, everything from the case severities and all that, but also talks about um, case escalation. <clears throat> and you also can look at it, you know, here. And it's pretty straightforward. Um, what, you know, first you have to determine, you know, to yourself, is this moving at the pace I want to, or is this person understanding the problem? You know, whatever it is that you feel maybe uncomfortable about, that you feel that needs to be moved along quicker. Um, so for, you know, the first thing is the case is, uh, at, you know, owned by a, an engineer. And, you know, you could easily just ask for them to engage additional resources. That literally could just be leaning across the aisle um, and asking somebody, hey, have you seen this before? Or I've got this problem or whatever. <clears throat> or it could be, you know, engaging the team's lead, the, their technical lead. Um, or their team lead and look for, you know, some information. It could be uh, depending, uh, you know, and, and take this with a grain of salt. Not all teams have what we refer to as escalation engineers. Like in the collaboration space, we don't have escalation engineers. They, uh, our TAC engineers can work and resolve the majority of problems. The next point is the business unit. So that's, you know, if we escalate, it's going there. Um, but some teams do have multiple layers of escalation. And uh, so it might be something that you, basically just to ask them if they can engage somebody, you know, uh, to help out with the case. You can always reach out to the manager. If you look at any engineer's SIG file, you'll see in the very bottom, they'll usually have, you know, their contact information, their office hours, all that good stuff. Um, but it, sometimes they'll have their team and tech lead, but there is a requirement for them to have their ma direct manager. And you should be able to reach out to that person either by phone or email or however you want. I've had people reach out to me with um, the WebEx, um, you know, directly through the chat bot and engage me on cases and say, hey, this is what the situation is and it's not moving along quick enough. Um, if it's after hours or something like that and you don't feel you're going to get one of those people, 
or even during hours, you can always call into the TAC duty manager. You could call in, you know, if you're in the United States to 800-553-2447, and you could just say, hey, I would like to speak to the TAC duty manager. And that person, it's a global resource. During the, the day, there's usually two to three of them available, and they will be, you know, they'll, you know, ask you for your case number, ask you what the situation is. They'll take a review of, of it, and they'll look at what the next actions are. Sometimes the case might need to move, like app, yeah, nobody's going to be available. We're going to have to move the case, and they'll help initiate that action. Usually what they're going to do is they're going to reach out to a person like myself, a direct line manager, and be like, hey, I've got this customer. This is what the situation is, um, and this is what they need, and I will review the case, and we'll come up with the best action, maybe drag in extra resources or something like that. And, you know, that that's basically where the buck stops. Um, you know, you could always try to escalate above it, but it's always going to come back to a person like myself and the uh, whoever the case owner is. So then we move on to like solving the problem. You know, that's what is, res, you know, resolution of a problem. You know, certainly for a network down, we're looking for restoration of service. Um, uh, when I worked in the telco world, everything was about the restoration of service. And I'm sure folks have heard the old carrier grade solutions and the five nines and all that we really lived by that that was uh, a big deal you counted outages down into minutes um uh and so you know that's what we look at you know is restoring the service um and sometimes you know restoration of service is getting it limping or something like that and getting the customer back into a, a somewhat working state and then working towards full resolution as quickly as we can um, and it could be, you know, anything of identifying a bug. Obviously, you find a software defect. That's obviously going to require um, something more, you know, a pro an upgrade, which could lead to many other considerations. Um, or it could be that there's a workaround that could be applied, you know, right there on the spot or during a maintenance window without doing the uh, the upgrade. And then the customer can choose to, you know, like, hey, we're we're gonna we're fine with the the workaround, you know. We're going to do a, a major upgrade. We'll just make sure that this is in the new release coming up, and they'll approach it that way. Um, but you know, in general, that's the way uh, the the idea of solving a case goes. And and in the end, it, it goes down to like what I said earlier. It's all at the comfort of a customer saying that yes, they agree that the the problem is resolved to their satisfaction, and then they say we can disengage. Um, so our, our basically our global policy is that but basically a customer says, hey, the solution has been provided. Um, and then only after that is the case closed with one, the customer's permission. And that's what we look for the majority of the time. Or if we uh, apply the three strike rule and that should happen over a succession of days. Um, we, you know, it should be over a period of three strikes over every five business days. So you're talking about two plus weeks. Um, and it should be followed, you know, a, a phone call or something like that should be done just to verify. Now, we know a lot of customers over the years know that they're like, hey, if we don't respond to this case, they're going to close it. And that's their closing mechanism. But it would be better if we got a response that somebody gave us the affirmative. Yes, this addressed the problem and we're fine with that. Go ahead and close the case. And then the final portion of the of, of the whole picture of what we do in CX centers is uh, the beyond the fix part, the uh, continuous improvement part. And, you know, we get a lot of our um, our feedback from you folks through surveys. I believe we're at 100% on case uh, case surveys. You get it, open a case, you close a case, and you get a tax survey. Uh, and we take that information that you provide back to us and we uh, use it on that closed loop. You know, if there are problems with um, processes, knowledge gaps, whatever, we help try to close those to provide the best experience of the customer. Um, you also could take a look at, you know, other parts of uh, beyond the fix or proactive, um, you know, resolution is maybe during the, the process of a case, you uploaded a little bunch of log files, or maybe the engineer found some other issues on their own, and it's all called out. And, you know, part of it is like, hey, we see, you know, we see you open a case on this and we resolved it, but you also ran into this um, field notice or this P-cert I just wanted to make you aware of it, and you should, you know, this is what you need to to do to resolve that, and then it's up to the customer to plan it out and all that. That's, you know, it's their run the business. It could be like, yeah, could you guys, could you, you know, open another case, 
and help us with uh, the idea of software migration or something like that. Um, but that's all in the idea of the proactive resolution. And it's giving that information for something that you didn't necessarily know was an issue. Could be that you didn't subscribe to notification services or anything like that. Um, and we get that information in front of you so you can make a business decision on what to do going forward there. That's the overall intent that we have within our organization. Again, it's a very large organization. We try to deliver uh, equally across every team, across every technology, all that. Obviously, it's it's a challenge, but uh, that is what the overall intent is, and that's what we drive for in uh, technical services. Wow, that, that was a lot of information, and that was really good. Uh, one thing I do want to point out and drive home is that um, you don't have to rely on your SEs to escalate the cases, as Chris was saying. You know, you can take it upon yourself. We want to help you, and we will. Uh, but sometimes we may not be as fast as you'd like, right? So yeah. it'd be great if you guys could just go in there and escalate those cases yourself as well. And and call out onto us, and we'll help you. You know, but don't don't run to us as the first resource, because sometimes we just can't answer in a timely fashion, and we don't want to keep you waiting. You know, th that's fair. And we have other tools that customers can use. One of them is TAC ConnectBot. We've seen a very large uptick in it. You could go to just Google it, TAC Connect and Bot. And uh, so if you're using Teams, uh, you can subscribe to information on your cases. You can go through the SCM. And that provides basically uh, everything from the status of the case, what's going on with it. Uh, you can reach out directly to a manager. You can escalate the case. You can recue the case without engaging anybody else. And uh, I, I could, you know, if you wanted, I could probably pull up and show an example where a customer reached out to me. Um, sometimes it's after hours. We've actually changed the tool to be more mindful of the global um, time, what it is. So if somebody tries to reach out to an engineer like after hours, it'll let you know like, hey, we're outside of the, the hours and it'll give the uh, customer options. Like, you know, you could escalate it, you can engage a DM, you can have the case recued, whatever, and all that stuff. So um, again, that's about ease of doing business. It's something there for the customer to use right there. Um, they don't even have to engage anybody, but it will end up getting information in front of a person. That's a really good shout out, Chris. So I know, you know, working virtually, we're all really good at multitasking. So ironically, we're you know discussing about TAC, we're discussing about CX, but I actually had a customer reach out to me during this call saying, hey, Joe, I need help escalating a case, I need a requeue because we worked on the case last night, the engineer is obviously off ship, we need someone now. Um, so I could do two things, either A, I could, you know, completely ignore my customer when they're desperately in need or help them out, provide some of those best practices you talked about, right? So what I did was I, you know, opened up another tab, went in the bot myself, requeued the case, and they were able to get someone right away. Um, and then what's cool, you know, is after, you know, we handle everything, we want to spread those best practices that you talked about, right? Because uh, I think, you know, just from my perspective with, you know, working with some of my customers, a lot of, you know, these engagements, you know, it's, you know, it takes some time to learn, right? I think all of us, we've been in that, that space where we've had issues and we just desperately need help, right? Uh, but just coming up with those best practices and just continue to advocate, right? I think continue to advocate for Cisco, our customers and TAC, I think that all really builds a whole holistic view um, from, you know, once we sell a product to we support the product. And then like he mentioned, that continuous development. Um, so all I could say, man, I'm, I think just in behalf of the customers that we uh, interface, you know, we, we thank you guys. Yeah, I think CX has truly been crucial for a lot of our success and our customer success. And, and I know you guys work tremendously hard. So all I can say is thank you so much for everything that you do, Chris. Right on. So I think what this leads us into is the closing. So let's go ahead and pivot over to a place where you can view not only this episode, but past episodes of Tech Glam Live. So Doreen, what can we do to view this content? All right. So today's episode will be posted on my YouTube channel, Tech Glam TV. There you're going to find episodes of Tech Glam Live and other videos related to Cisco. So if you missed our previous episode on Thousand Eyes, it is now available on TechLam TV. We've also presented IWO, Intersight Workload Optimizer, and AppD in the past. They're going to be up very soon on the site as well. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, so you can go ahead and get notified when those 
episodes are uploaded and available for viewing. Excellent. And that, I think, Doreen, we hit the end of our show. Am I right? I think so. I think so. Thank you guys so much for an awesome presentation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Joe. This was an amazing time spent with you guys. Yes. And to you, Doreen, thank you so much for being my wonderful co-host as always. Um, so with that said, we're going to wrap team. up. We're a team. <laughs> exactly. Like at Cisco, all one team. So I think that concludes everything. So everyone have a wonderful rest of your morning. Once again, Chris, thank you so much for being an awesome uh, participant. Not a participant. You're more than a participant. And awesome. <laughs> He's part of the team. Yes, you're part of the team. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and thank you to all the customers that join our calls. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. All right. Thank you. Have a good day.